Like it is a true concept. The problem is when everyone uses it, our brains have no way of determining, well, who is the truth teller here and who are the pretenders? Mm. So I think the key is removing yourself from jargon because our brains are now, because we receive so much messaging, it's so wired. All right, hey guys, we have the amazing Patrick Ward with us. And um, I first discovered Patrick, you know, when I was, you know, browsing through LinkedIn. And then there was this show called Words with Ward. You know, apparently you go on this show and then you say, what is your favorite, what is the word that you use more? And, you know, what is the word that you use less? So I, I think of Patrick as sort of the wordsmith of LinkedIn. You know, he is now the editor-in-chief you know, for High Speed Experts, a new role that he was just taken on. He was previously the head of marketing for Dogtown Media. Um, and he's part of a council, you know, not some sort of council that, like, you know, like Lord of the Rings, it's the Forbes Communication <laughs> Council. And um, later we will talk about it, but he's also the host of LinkedIn Local in LA. Hi, Patrick. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Bob. Yeah, yeah. So, so I love your content, you know, the, the words with war really brought out the emphasis of the importance of words. And I really love words as well. So how can you just tell us, you know, how did this relationship with words come about? Were you a, a person who likes to read when you were young? Or how did you know, your, you come to writing and also the interest in words? Yeah, so I think if I look where did this come from, I think it comes from sort of two main places. One, funnily enough, I studied Latin at high school uh, for six years, uh, and everyone says to me the same thing of, no, Latin's a dead language, why would you study that? But what it actually did give me was a way to structure sentences. The funny thing is when in my English classes, I was really just, you know, doing Shakespeare, deconstructing texts, whereas Latin actually taught me, you know, grammatical sentence structure and therefore gave me a certain writing style. And I took that into my first job, which was as a copywriter at an ad agency, uh, first with insurance, but then started doing some other different industries. And, and through that, I think that's what gave me this, this big interest in words and how you can use words to effectively communicate your message. And I think that's really the crux of it in that so many people when they're writing like corporate emails, say they're writing you know, internally to other people, they don't even realize how they're coming across and they're actually weakening their own point. So like a classic example that I like to use is when people use the word just, as in, you know, if I said to you, hi, Bob, just wanted to get your feedback. Now, just in that sentence is a passive qualifier. And what it basically means is I'm putting myself in a role of subservience to you and it makes me sound weaker in my message. And when you do that, you actually are not gaining the respect that you deserve. I mean, I always say that everyone is an expert in something. So use those words to communicate that expertise. And I think that's really what it boils down to. So when I was coming up with, okay, I'm on LinkedIn now, what am I going to come up with for some content? I immediately thought, well, words, because I can come up with 10 to 20 ideas about words, you know, like that. And it, it, it's not too taxing. And it's the one thing I do tell anyone looking to get on to LinkedIn and, and start creating their own content. Think of the area or the topic that you can come up with 10 to 20 ideas just like that and that tells you okay well that's that's not too taxing that's not too difficult for you to do because it's so natural to how you act and therefore how you show up on linkedin amazing stuff amazing stuff i i i work as a marketer and i do understand you know, the power of words you know uh, every ad that goes out, every email headline, every landing page headline has to be very intentional when it comes to 
the words that we use. It can be um, quite, it can make a quite a big difference in terms of conversions and also in terms of uh, the marketing. So um, can you briefly explain to my audience, since we talked a lot about words, how, how words has impacted, you know, uh, your, your work throughout the years? Yeah, I, I think the way that it impacts me is that obviously I've been through a lot of different industries. So I started with insurance, then went real estate, uh, finance, travel, tech, and now, you know, still kind of tech, but uh, with uh, internet services specifically at High Speed Experts. And I think the key thing there is it's not so much about what you personally want to say with mm -hmm. words, but it's using the words that are right for your audience. So what I mean by that is that you need to not just understand your audience, you need to speak to your audience and speak as one of your audience. I think Zach Messler said this a few days ago at uh, Entrepreneur Business Live, which we were just talking about uh, before this Richard Moore's event. But the key is if you're spending all your time talking about me or in a way that works for you, then you're forgetting about the audience. And at the end of the day, people will only buy from you because you're solving a particular problem of theirs. Mm. So how do you communicate that? Well, you need to communicate in the way that they're receptive to mm -hmm. rather than, hey, look at me, look at me, you know, words. So don't say we won this award or we did this. Say you will solve this problem of yours with this service. Yeah, that's a uh, great insight. You know, um, I try to, in, in all form of copy or all form of ads, try to uh, solve the customer's problem. That, that all comes from, as a marketer or maybe as a person in advertising, um, to understand how your audience speaks and what's, what words affect your audience. So, so as, as uh, in throughout your career, what, um, what are the tools that you use to understand, you know, how this, how do you, what words to use for your audience? Funnily enough, I think the key thing is interviewing your audience or finding ways to speak to them in person. This is, I, I think, the great irony of my entire career. My entire career has been in digital, and yet I'm the biggest proponent for in-person. Um, I had, while I had a marketing major in uh, college, I also had a minor in psychology. And I think that's really what it comes down to, is understanding how people think. And the only way you can really understand that is you, you can't do it through text. You've got to, at, at the very least, get on the phone with them, if not a video call, but preferably get it in person because only through that do you get a full 360 degree understanding of, you know, the people who are buying from you mm. and or, you know, what makes them tick, you know, because you can't just say, oh, you know, I'll, I'll sell this service and my people will buy, you know, my audience will buy from it. No, your product fits into as a small part of this whole person's life, mm. right? Like this person has, you know, a full 360 degree view of, you know, they have a, they have a particular job, they have a particular family life, particular hobbies, everything about that so you need to understand where does where does your product fit into that whole ecosystem of a person and you can only really get to that understanding if you know the person mm -hmm. so that's where i really start from i think that it's so crucial just to go to the source mm -hmm. rather than you know I think too often, funnily enough, too often we get caught up in, you know, numbers or like little optimizations rather than understanding that at the end of the day, there is a human at the end of this process and it is how that human reacts and responds to the world that matters rather than, oh, like, let's tweak, you know, make the size of this font a little bigger. That's all in, you know, that's all necessary, but at the end of the day, it's still the human first. Cool. Yeah. Um, if, if uh, for me, myself, if I can't, um, you know, meet my customers, I do meet my 
potential customers once in a while. I think another way that you could do this research by scale is to do research uh, with forums. I use Google Docs or whatever and ask specific questions, you know, how would you describe your experience with digital or things like that? And it gives uh, open-ended questions and plus, you know, like uh, check boxes, but open-ended questions really dives into, you know, what is their current understanding? So I love uh, doing research and I love talking to people and I love formulating questions. Um, but, but when it comes to, you know, using words for marketing, because I generally talk about marketing a lot, you know, what, what are the tips uh, that you have when it comes to, you know, writing uh, words for marketing material? I think my, my number one tip comes down to write the way that you speak. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by this is that so many people, you know, like they're consumers throughout their day to day. And this is particularly true of marketers. We're consumers day to day. We come to our job and then we put on our marketing hat and somehow we, we stop, we, we speak in a completely different way. We start speaking, you know, marketing speak, marketing jargon, and it just doesn't work because would it work on us? No, it wouldn't. So why do we think that it'll work on someone else? And yeah. so I've actually always found, and this, funnily enough, this was just a hunch. This was just sort of try, trying, uh, trying it out and seeing whether it worked or not, and it did. The best success I've always had with my copy is when it sounds just like me. And you, you'll pick up on this. When people start saying like, you know, oh, you know, I heard your voice when you wrote that. Or, you know, it sounded like we were having a conversation. Or these, these little things that people will say to you when they read what you write, that to me is always the most effective copy because at the end of the day, like, words are handicapped, right? Words are limited in the fact that there is only text, right? You don't have the two other main forms of communication, which is tone and nonverbal cues like body language and expression. So you're relying on your words to do a whole lot. So why not give it a bit of a boost by making it sound as if you were speaking? Nice, nice. Um, so I'll, I'll reverse that question a bit. It's a great tip. I'll reverse that question and I'll say, what are the common mistakes you see people make when it comes to words for marketing? Um, the easiest one is too much jargon and overused jargon. And this is where marketers have to be particularly careful because marketers have a real bad habit of taking like a buzzword mm. and then running with it so much that it ruins that word. So a classic case is, you know, the word like value. This mm. is the sad thing that I see all the time on LinkedIn. Everyone's saying, you know, add value, add value, add value. Now that is true. Like it is a true concept. The problem is when everyone uses it, our brains have no way of determining, well, who is the truth teller here and who are the pretenders? Mm. So I think the key is removing yourself from jargon because our brains are now, because we receive so much messaging, it's so wired to once mm. we hear a jargon word, Mm -hmm. We just immediately assume, oh well, that person's using that as a as a as a shield, as a, mm -hmm. to cloak cloak and dagger what their actual message is. If you can actually distill your message into very simple, easy to understand words and language, that's when you'll start getting success because you're not hiding anything. That's the thing. I've always found that the best success I've had has been when I am just transparent it's literally just i'm telling this is the story this is what it is and and if you want to buy it great and if you don't want to buy it so be it rather than trying to you know con people into buying your product because that's not going to work in the long term maybe you'll get the sale now but mm -hmm. you're not going to make a lifetime customer out of that person yep amazing stuff do you have a method to test your your writing or copy uh when it comes to, you know, knowing, uh, you know, whether this makes sense to your target audience? 
So generally, because I'm in uh, the SEO game, uh, Google Optimize uh, is the main way that I use uh, to test my copy. And that's purely just to do split A-B testing of mm -hmm. um, uh, different landing pages. Uh, I found it a really useful tool and you're just, I mean, the metrics are right there. You're able to see, okay, well, this landing page performed better, therefore this copy was more resonant with the audience. Um, if you're using, you know, uh, other ways, uh, email, A-B split testing is also a good way for if you're doing more newsletter based. Mm -hmm. um, and then just beyond that, just experiment, see what works. You know, if, if you take a risk and it doesn't work, try something else. And if it does work, great, do more of it. But it really doesn't have to be that complicated. Cool, cool, cool. Um, yeah, Google Optimizer is quite an amazing tool and I think it's underrated. I think more people should be checking it out. Um, so you, yeah, you briefly mentioned SEO and uh, I've uh, not really uh, talked to a writer about this before, but how has SEO affected your writing? You know, would you go for an amazing headline or would you go for a headline with better SEO? But yeah, no, it's, a, it's an interesting point. So SEO obviously is a perpetually evolving uh, situation. Mm. Anyone who says, oh, well, I've got SEO down now. And they'll say, yeah. well, that's true. But three months from now, six months from now, Google changes the algorithm and the game changes. So you do need to have a testing mindset. I think in the past, there was a certain way of writing, quote unquote, for SEO. Right, mm -hmm. it was being sort of strategic with your keywords. It was leading with certain terms early in your, uh, you know, on your landing pages that didn't maybe uh, resonate so well with an audience, but they did when Google crawls it. Mm. The funny thing is, what we've seen in about the last year is Google has changed the game again, and this I think will be a bit more of a longer term trend where they are actually valuing how much people engage with your article. So they're measuring things like time spent on page. They're measuring bounce rates. They're measuring comments if you're writing a blog. They're measuring social media shares. So in that respect, I think while I did have to, in my early years, learn a certain style of SEO writing, I think it's interesting that Google has pulled it back to my more natural writing, which is to educate, to inspire, or to entertain an audience. Mm -hmm. And therefore, those types of pages get more credence in the search results. So I think we're seeing a convergence between what works for your audience and therefore what works for Google. Yep, yep. I think one of the uh, rising uh, Google's uh, ranking factors this year is user experience. Like you said, bounce rates. Uh, you know, what does the user just do another search after visiting your page? Uh, but, but I do think that SEO still plays a role where it firstly gets your content discovered. Um, I think I heard somewhere on a podcast where a writer was saying like, like there's a demonstration right now in Hong Kong, like there's a sort of like a, so like if the, if your article title is like riots in Hong Kong, you'll be discovered. If you were saying the peep uprising of the people in Hong Kong, it's a catchy, catchy um, headline, but it's good for newspaper headline, but it doesn't get your article discovered because people will not be searching for that, you know? So no, that's actually, I mean, you bring up a good point. And in that respect, I would say, well, know which way you're writing. If you're writing for that landing page and you want it to rank on SEO, then do it through that route. Like you say, riots in Hong Kong, very simple. But if you want the more sensational, use that to pitch to press, right? It, again, knowing your medium, right? What, what is the goal of your content and what is the, the medium in which you're expressing it, therefore will dictate how you use that messaging. Right, right. Amazing stuff. I, I absolutely love that tip. Um, I personally have, um, uh, I've not had much experience pitching to, to media. Um, I know you're part of Ad Age and you know Forbes right now. So, so what what are your tips of you know people who want to get their article featured in publications? You know, what is the 
the right, right way to pitch to media or things like that? The funny thing is, and, and this is very true and any PR professional will tell you this, pitching to particularly those big publications is very, very challenging. And a lot of that is based on a couple of things. One, personal relationships, which is how most PR professionals operate. Uh, they often will have meetings with um, different writers. That wasn't going to work for me. Like, I just couldn't do it. I'm not a PR professional. I'm not paid to do that 100% of my time. Mm. The funny thing is the way that I got the Forbes and the Ad Age um, memberships was through my content on LinkedIn. I mm. you know, just kept posting. I connected with writers from different publications. Mm. And eventually what happened was the head of the memberships committee for those two publications, Ad Age and Forbes, reached out to me via a LinkedIn message, said, hey, I've noticed you're doing you know, great things in the advertising space. Would love to invite you to apply for the, these councils did so, got accepted, and that has now given me a fast track to both editors of those publications. That was the key. It wasn't actually me pitching them from, you know, on an outbound way. It was using my content as an inbound generator. And this is the thing that I teach in my workshops about LinkedIn. Don't get on LinkedIn because you necessarily have one goal in mind because mm. there are so many different opportunities that you can get. You can get connected to press. All, all writers pretty much are on LinkedIn. You can get podcast opportunities. You can get all these different opportunities that will be the vehicle for you to get into bigger mm. and bigger publications. And therefore you have social proof. Um, you know, once I started getting mentioning in Forbes, that was, you know, really wonderful for me because it's it's proving that you know while i personally know i have expertise an external third party source is validating that expertise nice nice it, uh, it's great to to be part of a communications council and i love what you said about um the inbound strategy so so let's talk about like lead generation strategy for a bit so so i think you've seen some of the content that i do um it's not the most entertaining content. I try not to stay away from you know, entertainment. Um, I try to give a lot of value. And it's not the content with the most views. You, know, you have a lot of... I, I, I always tell people that I'm strictly not a content creator. I'm strictly position myself as a thought leader. That's why I love talking about very serious stuff. And my challenge is because I always talk about things that are level 8 to 9 to 10 that I missed out on the majority of the audience who is still trying to figure out how to write or how to market from zero to two. But what I get out of it is I get consulting opportunities, I get speaking opportunities, and I get uh, really great connections, and I get to invite really great guests because they see the, the quality of the content. Uh, and it's, it's got me inbound uh, opportunities as well. But what... What do you think about, you know, someone who, you know, goes on LinkedIn today and wants to generate leads for, for his or her business, you know, you know, for consulting or for like a, you know, a software service? So what, what are your tips for lead gen? Yeah, I think it really comes down to a very simple strategy. And this is the strategy that I implement and it is the strategy that I think anyone can implement. Treat your profile as a landing page mm. and how you get people to that landing page is your content right mm. so you think of them in two separate ways right the content should be it should do one of three things it should either entertain educate which sounds like what you know what i've seen of yours bob is the the majority of yours <laughs> educate yeah. or inspire it just needs to do one of those three things and then from there, you put that into your content, you regularly show up, again, specifically not for the views, but for views from the right people, right? Mm -hmm. No point getting, I mean, we could all get 100,000 views on LinkedIn if we put a picture of a cat, you know, playing the piano or something like that. 
is that really relevant for our brand and for our, you know, for our product offering? No. So why would we do it? And then once you use that, use that content as the, uh, I think Richard Moore calls it a signal, you then drive people to check out your profile. Naturally, people get inquisitive, you know, oh, this is, you know, I've been enjoying this content for a while. I'll go to uh, the person's profile. And that is where it's key. Once they're on your profile, people make this number one mistake of that first summary. They'll have like, you know, here's my years of experience and here's my previous positions. And they write it like a bio, like a resume. And that is great if you're a job seeker. If you're not, if you're trying to sell a particular product, use that. That summary is like the key. People aren't going to scroll down that far unless they're really interested. So use that to get a call to action. Now, it's a very, it doesn't have to be that complicated. All I do is put a, a few little paragraphs about what High Speed Experts is, and then from there, message me or email me, or there's my phone number. That's it. I'm just trying to get a conversation. But that I've found a much more successful strategy than the other thing which you see on LinkedIn, which is people, you know, the old school way of putting the call to action in their content, of trying to sell in their content, because that starts getting too pushy. And people don't like being sold to. You know, no one likes being sold to. Particularly in this in this internet age, we all have access to so much information. Your offering needs to just be evident that it is the best, rather than telling people you're the best. Nice, nice. That's that's great stuff, and that's great content. I will put it up on LinkedIn. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, when it comes to to writing as well, I've worked with different writers. Uh, and great point you had on LinkedIn just now. I've worked with a lot of um, great writers, and uh, there seems to be, for me, in my, my experience, there are people who are very good at article writing, which they are very good at long form. And sometimes they are not the best people when it comes to short form. And I have, like I myself, am uh, my first internship opportunity was a copywriter and that's how I came up and I'm very good at writing catchy short form Facebook ad copy um, as a writer yourself you know um, what how do you balance you know writing for these two you know some people are very good at long form and how do you balance you know between long form and the short form style of writing yeah, I, th I mean, I think it's two main things. I think one, if you're particularly good at one style versus the other, do lean into that, right? Mm -hmm. If you're good at long form, do long form. But therefore, don't compete. You know, if you're good at long form, don't go on Twitter because that's not going to be your right medium. Instead, I would, ironically enough, say go to medium, which prioritizes, you know, long for long form, more detailed content. But you do need to pick up the tips and tricks. I mean, I, I'm like you. I, I started as a copywriter, but for more specifically, I was long-form content, you know, mm -hmm. long-form blog posts. And so I had to learn and relearn mm -hmm. uh, a way of writing when I started doing more short-form on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And the main thing that I had to learn was rather than, you know, write this well-structured, you know, blog post that goes, you know, through all these steps, I needed to lead with the call to action. Mm. I needed to lead with something that, you know, that attention grabber that got people to engage right in that first instance, which was against my natural inclination. My natural inclination was, you know, build an argument, build the steps to a conclusion, but then I had to reverse engineer it for short form. But I think that that is the key is that one you know, be willing to, to learn the other method. But mm. two, also understand your strengths. I think too many people are told, you know, improve your weaknesses. And while we need to manage our weaknesses, mm -hmm. why would we not lean into our strengths, right? If these are our strengths, they're the easiest things for us to do mm. therefore the easiest for us to master. And mm. therefore, it's what we should be prioritizing over anything else. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great advice for you know people starting out in writing. 
and uh, I do find that my strengths are in short form, but sometimes I do write one or two long articles once in a while, try to get on medium. Um, so when it comes to writing, I know you've um, written in different industries from finance to tech um, and to consumer. So um, how, how do you sort of adapt your, your writing in you know, different industries. It's like you, you talked about jargon and you know, sometimes the financial industry has a lot of jargon. You know, do you make the jargon more explainable or what do you do as a, popular, as a writer? Yeah, I think the, the key thing is you need to start mm -hmm. from the jargon to learn it mm -hmm. so that you can explain it without jargon. And what I mean by that is when you go into industries, the way I've always adopted the mindset of go in and particularly in that first 90 to 180 days mm -hmm. you spend within an industry, just be a sponge and absorb everything you can about that industry because, mm -hmm. you know, you're not going to know everything. So you need to know that they will have a certain way of speaking. You know, I, I particularly found this in finance where it, that was my first in-house job at a finance company. So, you know, I'd be in meetings and they'd be saying all these different terms and I knew, okay, I need to learn what these terms are. Otherwise, I'm, I'm not going to be able to contribute. But having said that, once you do understand, you know, the different ways they're talking, then you can take it in a way that you can still talk internally. Mm. Internal communications is just as important as external. You can still talk internally with that jargon to the mm. people who understand it. But then when you're talking to your end consumer, then you can drop it, start using more easy to understand, you know, everyday language. I think that's the balance you need to strike. You need to be able to know that when you're inside an organization, mm -hmm. jargon is often used as a helpful shorthand. So mm -hmm. you know, it's quicker, it's more efficient with your communication. But you have to remember then when you turn around and write some copy for an email, you know, a website, you know, an ad that goes out to the public, you know, they're not going to understand that same jargon short form. Nice, nice. Uh, my, my practice when it comes to simplifying content is, I think this applies to teaching as well. I try to get people from point A to point B. Um, I realized with a lot of technical writers, a lot of writers in more technical industries, they try to get people from point A to point Z too fast. Like I try to make it simple. So I, I'll give you an example where I market a coding bootcamp and I try to sell to them, learn to code to build websites first, learn to code, start learning to code instead of learn to code to build an app, you know? So, that's, so I always start from the simplest point of achievement that the customer can make. That's, that's makes sense. No, that absolutely makes sense. It, it, why, like, if they're that interested in getting from point A to point B, then they'll go from B to C and then C to D. But, but you're always going to have a little bit of drop-off along the way. Why would you go A to Z? Because the, then everyone's just going to go too hard, too complicated. I can't do that. I'm not uh, going to spend that time. Great, great, great advice. Uh, I, I love that you agreed with me. Uh, <laughs> so you've, you've written, uh, so I, do you do you work for work for a while in Sydney, right? Yes, I was in Sydney. I was born and raised in Sydney. Mm -hmm. uh, moved to America three and a half years ago, um, mm -hmm. but I did get my my start at an ad agency in Sydney. Was there for three years in in house in that agency, but I also did some remote work for them for a while. That was when I did travel. So when I I lived in Vietnam for a couple of months. Wow. I lived in Thailand for a month. Um, so I was doing travel copywriting while I was there. All right, all right. So, 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 so my next question is more applicable to where I am, which is Malaysia. But, um, and I think, I don't know about America, but do you find any challenges when it comes to localizing your content? So, for example, you might write, be writing copy for the whole of the US or sometimes internationally. Do you have any challenges when it comes to localizing, you know, the copy or the content style? Funny thing is, I get more challenges localizing for America 
than when I'm localizing for, you know, an international audience. Uh -huh. And I think the main reason is when I'm, uh, when I'm localizing for an international audience, I'm sort of very cognizant of like, you know, the cultural differences. So maybe I'll spend more time of doing research. The funny thing is, and this is, you know, a mistake that goes both ways actually between Australia, America and, and Britain particularly, is that all three of us think, oh, well, we all speak English, so we're all you know, the same. And then what you don't realise is, no, we all have a very unique cultural upbringing and that culture means that, you know, certain phrases are used in one context that aren't used in another. And I think the way that I've got around it, ironically enough, is just by purely living in America for the last three and a half years, you know, that is the number one cultural immersion. I, but I, even to this day, I'll still say, you know, certain words like, I mean, the classic example is Fortnite. I, I once asked a coworker, did we get paid fortnightly? And they looked at me with this puzzled expression of like, what's, what's a fortnight? Like, the video game <laughs> I was like no two weeks and they're like oh you mean bi-weekly so those like little things uh still crop up in my day to day but I think that 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 does get to the key I think what you said earlier of um doing your research is so important when localizing your content because obviously we can't always immerse ourselves you know, in the different cultures that we operate in. I mean, I'm lucky enough to to live in the place where I'm, uh, you know, the culture that I'm working for. But at the same time, you know, particularly in this globalised world that we now operate in, you know, we might be living in one part of the world, writing content for another, and then we have a different audience for, you know, this part. So, you know, it, it becomes increasingly segmented. So starting from that good foundation of research and, and understanding of the cultural nuances really puts you in the best position for success. Nice, nice. That's, that's great advice. Like do, do your research because a simple word like Fortnite or maybe a simpler word like money or cash is used in very different ways in different parts of the world. So, so great stuff. So, so before we go, let's do a quick Word, uh, words with words. So, so what is your favorite word right now? My favorite word, uh, funnily enough, this is one that gets me uh, a, a lot of trouble, uh, but sorry. And I mean this in a very specific way. I mean the ability to use it to humble yourself. Mm -hmm. I think too often people are looking to blame rather than to accept responsibility. And I tell this particularly to um, you know, new graduates who are coming into the workforce and looking you know, to make those, those impacts, you know, get that first job and, and really contribute. Being able to take personal responsibility, being able to humble yourself and apologize when something doesn't go right mm -hmm. is crucial because what it shows is that you can be relied upon you are dependable. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you are someone who should be trusted. And mm -hmm. particularly in today's age where, you know, trust can evaporate like that. We see this all the time with companies, with brands. They'll put out an off message or there'll be some scandal and trust in that organization goes. So what does that tell you? That tells you that is what consumers really prioritize over anything else. So if you can show yourself to be trustworthy, that really puts yourself in a good standpoint. Having said that, I do understand, and the, the comment I usually get when people say, oh, why is, you know, sorry, your favorite word, is that some people apologize too much, right? Yeah. They'll apologize before giving their point of view. And that I say, no, you should never apologize for giving your point of view or your expertise because that, is your expertise, you know, stand firm, stand strong in your convictions. Mm -hmm. You're never going to appeal to everyone. I tell this to marketers all the time. You're never going to appeal to everyone. You need to take a stance and just stand with the right people for you, whether that's an audience, whether that's a community, whether that's a tribe, whoever those people are, mm -hmm. they're the only people that matter. Great, great stuff. Okay, since since you si you said you studied Latin, so can you? What's your favorite Latin word? Oh, 
I, I would have to say, it, I mean, it is cliche, but it's going to be a, a phrase of yacta alia est, which was what Caesar said when crossing the Rubicon River. And uh, it literally translates to the die is cast. And the reason that I really like this phrase is it's an audacious phrase. It's a phrase of courage. And I really resonate with it very strongly for one particular reason. So when I moved to America, mm. I didn't have a job lined up. I was leaving behind all my family, I was leaving behind all my friends, <laughs> just taking a gamble. And I was taking a gamble for one specific reason. I wanted to, you know, be bold, be courageous and do something, you know, unprecedented for myself. <laughs> And a lot of people say, well, well, how did you do that? Like, how did you get that mindset to do that? And I got it for one of two reasons. Because I was of the opinion that if I try this out, if America works out, great, it's a success. That's wonderful. If it doesn't, if it fails, and I have to drag, you know, myself back to Australia, tail between my legs, I would still have been in the same position before I left. And that's what I tell people understand what is the worst thing that can happen to you that's your baseline and usually the worst thing is not actually that bad now think of all the upside mm. all that success that you could get mm -hmm. well then it seems it seems evident that you should make the courageous decision great stuff great stuff i hope i hope everyone you know has this um you know self motivation you know this this, uh, I see that in you, I see that in a lot of LinkedIn content creators, they are people who take the risk, who go out and create content and try to make a difference in their lives. But um, what I see in my day to day is a lot of people who don't take the risk, you know, who don't step out. And I, I sometimes think maybe they are afraid or maybe they are, uh, they don't see the point or maybe that's not really what they want. So yeah, so that's what I'm trying to figure out on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's a good point that mm -hmm. people take the time and don't just do something because, you know, someone told you to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, take the time, understand yourself, develop that self-awareness, and mm -hmm. from there you can go, okay, well, this is what I want. Okay, I might have fear, but I'm going to pursue it. Or no, everyone says do this, but I don't want to do it. And I know that it's not right for me, so I'm not going to do it. You know, just that is so crucial to understand yourself first before mm -hmm. you can show up in the world in the way that you want oh. to. Nice, nice, nice. So moving on, what is the word that you wish people would use less? Uh, I think we already said it, but I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate it. Uh, just. Oh, just. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like. Um, all of these like little passive qualifiers that we, we put into our language. Another one I will, will add, uh, and this is an interesting one, this is purely for corporate, don't use the word hey as uh, an introduction. So as in like, don't write hey Bob, say mm. hi Bob. And it's a very subtle difference and the reason you don't is because hey can come across to different people two ways it can either come across as too familiar mm -hmm. and too too casualized or b it comes across as a little aggressive and so always use hi because it is a neutral word and therefore it's not going to put people offside in the same way it's a very little difference but it's an important one particularly when you're writing internal emails to you know executives or, or someone that you need to buy into whatever your initiative is yeah, I, I, I've not noticed that, but think about my emails. I always start with hi, especially to, um, so, so I write a lot of emails to invite people to get on my show. So I always keep it short. <laughs> I keep it like, hey, I'm this, uh, this is what I want to do, and let me know if you have 40 minutes. Just straightforward and it gets very high, and I always start with hi, and I, as a subtlety, I always say the person's full name. Like, if I wouldn't say, hi, Patrick, even though, like, we, we sort of connected on LinkedIn. I will say, if it's a cold email, I'll say, Patrick, hi, Patrick, word in a way. So, yeah, that's 
some subtlety that you know I use for my emails as well. And and as a writer, the next question is, you know, what what is your favorite book? My favorite book, funnily enough, is Heart of Darkness. Mm -hmm. And it's a very strange one. A lot of people, you know, find this very odd. But the reason I like Heart of Darkness, it was written by Joseph Conrad, I believe mm -hmm. in about the early 1900s. Uh, it did get adapted into the film Apocalypse Now mm. um, uh, by Coppola. And the reason that I like it is it's a very interesting deconstruction of humanity. It's a very bleak book. I'm not going to lie. It's a very dark book. Uh, but it basically talks about how our civilization is constructed. Mm -hmm. And it also shows where humanity can go if we're not careful. Now, a lot of people say, well, why would you like such a depressing book? And I say, I think it is important to understand the full breadth of our experience as humans by understanding where we can go to when we are dark, when we are negative. Mm -hmm. Also, it flips on its head to say, well, here's all our potential. Here's what we could do with our lives if we all decide together to join, to be good to one another, to be kind to one another, and that therefore can raise the, the, the experience of humanity. And this is honestly, I think, reflected in my experience on LinkedIn. So I've been in you know, social media. I started with Facebook, then with Twitter, you know, Instagram, all through you know, doing it for different corporate brands. And the funny thing is, is of all my experience, LinkedIn is the first social network that I've joined that actually makes me excited to get on it every day. You know, I, I'm actually looking forward to getting online, seeing what people are sharing. And I think a big part of that is this movement where people are positive, but not just positive, are able to debate very complex issues mm. and yet still be respectful about it. The funny thing is, maybe this might have been a couple of months ago, I got someone who commented on one of my posts and I could tell already they were a little aggressive with their tone and I thought, oh no, this, this person might be, you know, might be ready to be a troll. But I approached it rationally. I, you know, talked through the points. It must have been about 20 or 30 comments long. And eventually by the end, both of us had come to an understanding of, oh, I see where your point is coming from and I see where my point is coming from. That level of respect and that intellectual discourse is, is, is refreshing. And, I mean, certainly as someone who lives in America and very politically divisive times, it is nice to see that humans still have that capacity for having a debate without resorting to name-calling. Mm-hmm. Amazing stuff. Uh, talk, talking about sort of conflict, I, I generally do, do not engage with negative comments. Uh, but, but I think the most, just to share a bit, the most influential book I read uh, last year or listened to was Nonviolent Communication. And it puts a big emphasis of first listening to the other side's arguments. And then if you want to counter, you counter. But that's what is lacking in the world right now. Um, there's a lack of, uh, for me, listening. And uh, you, you have to understand, it's also the best way to debate. If you don't understand what the person's points are, you can't have a valid point. So that's, that's what I get, you know, from, from, you know, communication. So yeah, thanks for your time, uh, Patrick. Uh, it's almost been an hour. Thanks so much uh, for talking to me. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you know if I ever go to LA. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, Bob. It was a pleasure. Right.